A few days after his consecration, Celestine announced his election to the Catholic world, writing among other things to King Edward of England. After emphatically calling attention to the inscrutable ways of God and to the unfortunate delay in the election of his successor to Nicholas IV, he told how the cardinals were suddenly moved to elect him. Although he knew that the burden that they had been put upon him was far too heavy for his weak shoulders, especially as for a great length of time he had been leading the life of a hermit, he had accepted it, as he knew that a longer vacancy of the Holy See would be most detrimental to the Church. He also feared resisting the call of God, trusting that the Almighty would help his inexperience. Meanwhile, he urged Edward to reign with justice, to work for the peace of his people and surrounding nations, promising him that he would do all that he could to promote his interests. Among the many letters of congratulations which the new Pope received, one has come down to us. It was from the Archbishop of York, sent by Romanus, Archbishop of York, a man who had been in favor with five popes, from Innocent the Fourth to Nicholas the Fourth, Addressing his Father and Lord in Christ, subscribing himself the low, Pope's lowly servant, and professing his complete subjugation to him, he told him how the church at large was rejoicing at the close of the long vacancy of the chief see, and how much that joy was shared by the Church of York, directly dependent as it was on the Roman Church. Praying God to grant the Pope a long and happy life, he begged him to give a favorable reception to his proctors. Unfortunately, as a rule, neither one's own prayers nor those of others will make up for a want of training, and Celestine had had no manner of education for the post he was called upon to fill. Despite anything that could be done by his more serious and conscientious advisers, Celestine was misled by his monks, more well-meaning than well-informed, and deliberately deceived by many who were bent solely on advancing their own interests by any means. With the place and favor seekers, with the benefice hunters, and with all that tribe, many officials of the papal chancellery cooperated for gain. They sold documents drawn up in due form and sealed with what could be filled in as the purchasers desired. Although these, this last fact is not mentioned by the saint's disciple, he does tell us that cardinals and prelates, kings and magistrates, began to ask the Pope for benefices and churches and prebends, and he, inasmuch as he was simple and straight, generously granted all their requests. The more spiritually minded, such as many of his monks and laymen, sought spiritual favors. It was noised abroad that he had granted a plenary indulgence to all who had assisted at his consecration. Accordingly, crowds flocked to Aquila from all parts, anxious to drink from the fountain of mercy which Celestine had caused to flow, and so, on the octave of his coronation, he granted a similar indulgence. Then, adds his disciple, when he reflected how the rich ceased to not beg from him temporal goods, he bethought him how he might grant spiritual goods to the poor. He, therefore, granted a plenary indulgence to all who should visit the church of St. Maria de Calamaggio on the feast of the beheading of St. John the Baptist. This indulgence never became operative, as it was revoked by Boniface, who ordered the Celestines to hand over to him the bull granting it. In a word, to cite the conclusion of the famous contemporary canonist, Ioannis Andreas, he acted like an animal that lacks the light of reason. He would grant a favor in the morning, and then the evening recall it, and then grant it to another. By degrees, it must have filtered into the mind even of such a simple soul as Celestine that this wholesale concession of favors of every kind could not be quite in order. Before he resigned, this had become clear to him, and so, on the day of his resignation, he told the assembled cardinals that, of the many things he had done, he would like to undo those that he had not done well, but that, as he could not be sure which those were, he left it to his successor to decide the question. Creation of another disastrously unwise act was his creation of cardinals. 
He did well in creating cardinals and in creating twelve at once. Indeed, he would have done better if he had created four or five times that number, but circumstances spoilt his otherwise useful act. Celestine's disciple tells us that he had made the new cardinals because the church was not well served by the existing ones, and that those he created were among the best men that were to be found. He does not, however, tell us what other historians do, i.e., that they were chosen for him, for the most part at least, by King Charles. But even if other contemporaries had been as silent on the subject as Celestine's disciple, the list of the new cardinal's names would have spoken for itself. Speaking generally, the new cardinals were at any rate a body of esteemable men, though, to judge from the fact that seven of them died in the course of the five years following their election, they would appear to have been advanced in age. Then the Sacred College was called together suddenly on Friday, September 17th, and the names were so sprung upon them that they could do nothing but accept them. The whole twelve were thereupon solemnly acclaimed on the following day. Whatever truth there may be in these details, it is made certain that the twelve were proclaimed on September 18th, and that one of them, the Celestine Rochini, died on October 13th. Then, says the author of the Golden Legend, the Pope who, in the plenitude of his power, had made twelve cardinals, in the plenitude of his simplicity, made another, in the same way as he made the others, irregularly, and at the suggestion of another. This thirteenth cardinal was of a very different character, John of Castrolicelli, the Archbishop of Veneto, who became cardinal priest of St. Vitalis. One reason, perhaps, why Celestine made one mistake after another was that, although not altogether ignorant, he was in awe of the sacred college, and so presumably did not consult them much, and, though not without some skill in speaking, he would only address them simply in his mother tongue, and not in Latin, and would never himself make a public reply to any important question. No doubt, too, the relations between him and the older cardinals especially must have gone from bad to worse as they saw him, without or contrary to their advice, doing one imprudent thing after another. They had been particularly annoyed at the promotion of John Acastrolicelli. They had seen how, to ingratiate himself with Celestine, he, Benedictine as he was, had put off his black habit and had clothed himself with that of the Pope's order. Then, too, he had been given the hat after dinner in Celestine's private residence in Aquila. At first some of the cardinals refused to sit with him. But, says his biographer, patience made the Pope great. It was finally agreed to hold an inquiry into the custom regarding such appointments, and that meanwhile John should cease to wear the cardinal's hat. After a brief inquiry, the cardinals rehabilitated the man, partly from fear and partly from a secret hope, a hope, perhaps, that the Pope would soon resign, or perhaps more probably that the schemer would not at long enjoy his honors. At any rate, the ambitious man did not enjoy them long, as he died within a few months after he had received them. Finally, in view certainly of his contemplated resignation of the papacy, and to take away every chance of the cardinals being able to find a subterfuge for evading the conclave, Celestine issued another decision on the subject a few days before his resignation. He decreed that the conclave regulations were to hold good forever, and whether the papacy became vacant by death, resignation, or any other way. Celestine's next indiscretion was committed at San Germano, the town on the little hill at the foot of Monte Cassino. He attempted to force the monks of that famous monastery, to which his own congregation had been attached, to adopt his rule, and in sign thereof exchanged their black habit for the grey of his own. Not unnaturally, the monks objected, but Celestine made Angelarius, one of his own monks, abbot of the monastery, and those monks who would not conform were exiled. However, says Niccolò della Fratura, one of the sufferers, 
their Holy Father Benedict soon brought about the resignation of Pope Celestine, and his successor, Boniface, restored to the monastery the black habit and deposed Angelarius. Despite the helplessness of the Pope, much of the work of the Church went on as usual through the instrumentality of the cardinals and the permanent officials.